Like, Skelly's Garage isn't scripted, obviously. Um, there's no way you can script this much stupidity in one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit here on my stool, eat a burrito, and then try to figure out a solution. You might be wondering, how gross was the seat underneath? I mean, given what we saw on the carpet and, you know, what is still there. Forgive me, I'm wearing sweatpants. I know I'm a little bit underdressed. Welcome back to part four and the last part of the Unfaffening series. In the last episode, we finished installing the rear suspension, saw some old friends, I even made it out alive in spite of myself. We rejoin the action now in the new Skelly's Garage facility with our tasks laid before us. So, last time we talked, I gave you a list of things that were really annoying me and that I wanted to fix for sure. The first thing that we're gonna do is actually not on that list. It is right here. So this exhaust, I really like the way that it sounds. I wish it was a little quieter. I'm going to try to figure out how to do that. But the fact that it's bouncing around is driving me nuts. It is also probably just not good for the exhaust or the things that it's hitting. So I fixed it once before, but the bumper was in the way. So I've decided that I'm going to fix it again and hopefully this time permanently because if it doesn't work that way, I'm going to probably have to get a different muffler as much as I like this one. If it doesn't stay on, it's not worth the trouble. So to get proper access to the exhaust, I have to remove the rear bumper. And so I have to open the trunk and disassemble a few things first. Ah, good things. Hmm. Put that on later. I'm also f***ing deaf from that, by the way. So on each side, there are three 13 millimeter nuts right here under this guy. Do the same thing on this side. The last one is kind of annoying. I had to get a different wrench, a smaller one. Give it back! Give it back! <laughs> it doesn't want to give it back! Well, I guess you're... St oh no. The next instruction is to remove the fender liners. To that I say, what fender liners? I don't have them. I want them, but I don't have them at the moment. All right, well, we did our best. So here's the issue. This exhaust from a Ford Mustang uh, doesn't use the BMW's mounting point. The mounting point that the BMW is supposed to use is back there somewhere. There's basically a pole welded to the back of the muffler and it uses one of these hangers to hold it happily in place. Now, because this is an aftermarket muffler, and not even just an aftermarket muffler, but rather a muffler from a different car, somewhere along the line, a previous owner decided to use riv nuts to mount the exhaust to this area here. Now there are some complications with that. The first of which is that this exhaust is heavy. It's quite like, it's not light. Um, exhausts in general are not light. I, I'm pretty sure there's supposed to be another hanger in the middle and there isn't. So what we're left with is basically 20, 30 kilograms of weight resting on this rather thin piece of metal here using riv nuts, which are usually pretty good. I just don't think that they're really, you know, in any shape to hold this much weight. A closer look at the holes that the riv nuts used to go into confirms that story. All right, friends, time for a little bit of a physics lesson. The reason that this mount keeps failing when it's mounted here is because it should be mounted here. You see this hole? This exhaust, as I mentioned, is quite heavy. As it moves, because of engine vibrations and things like that, and you know the many, many cubic meters of air flowing through it at any given moment, it will vibrate. In fact, it will kind of create like a wave type of thing. The amplitude of that wave, by the time it reaches the exhaust tips here, is significantly higher than it is when it leaves the engine, which is why 
you get an exhaust note here, and if you take the headers off, it's just blah, 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 blah. it's completely unintelligible. Okay, I have to pop in here for a sec. I wasn't exactly right with what I was saying. First off, amplitude is volume, not pitch of noise. The way that the exhaust gases are routed through the exhaust, making them collide and change their frequency is what actually drives the exhaust sound. But more on topic, what we're actually seeing is more of a lever function. 50 newtons of force on the end of a long lever will generate far more force on a system than the same 50 newtons applied at the halfway point. That principle also works backwards. If you imagine that the exhaust mounts are fulcrums, we can easily see how the further that the next one is from the last, the more force is applied to it, which make the rib nuts rip out of the body. Anyway, if it was mounted back here, like the original BMW muffler was, that mounting point would experience significantly less stress than does this one. Now, I'm pretty sure BMW has, in the standard configuration, a mount here and a mount there, but I'm not even going to go there. This exhaust should have been mounted there, so I need to take this car to, to somebody who can weld on something here and attach it to the standard point, because otherwise, this is going to continue to happen. I couldn't fix this myself, but I knew someone else who could. I took FAF to some fine folks at an exhaust shop, where they fixed a broken center exhaust support, added a support roughly in the area where the original BMW one was supposed to be, and another one at the end of the exhaust. Thankfully, this excellent service was not particularly expensive, which is a rarity. With that sorted, it was time to take care of the failed throttle body. Now, the throttle body is under all this, but it's very simple in this car. You just push these buttons in and the sort of just comes out. Easy peasy. Once you're there, this is the throttle body. This is what we're looking at. Now, since the throttle body in this car is of the old style, which actually looks like it has clips here that this can come off and you can kind of clean the mechanism inside, I'm going to take this one off, I'm going to clean it, but I'm going to keep it as a backup. In case something happens, you never know. I mean, parts quality... Everyone says it, but parts quality really has gone downhill since, you know, since COVID started. Okay, getting to the throttle body is exceptionally simple. I mean, it's just this. There are like four bolts and, and that's it. Take the connector off, it gives us a little bit more view of what's going on here. We need to remove this hose clamp. This will all sort of just come out and we'll be able to probably just be able to just negotiate this thing out of here. Okay. This will come out. When you remove these hoses, be careful and gentle because some of them are going to want to break. And while I am a kind man and I accommodate many requests that my BMWs, Request of me, that is not one that I accommodate. So we'll remove that vacuum connector, it's right here. Make sure to put it back on. Now that the bolts are loose, we're just going to manually remove everything, but make sure that we have a magnet at the handy, because I don't want to lose any of these. It would be a humongous pain in the ass. Heinz, Zwei. Are they the same size? Those two are. Alright. Hi. Still the same size. All of these bolts have washers. They're all captive, so they're not gonna, you know, fall away. But just be careful. Okay. And out comes the throttle body. Easy as that. So like I said, this one is openable. Wow. This is an original throttle body. This was from 2001. This car finished the production line, I think, on the 23rd of April. So, yeah, this actually makes sense. This throttle body went for 196,000 miles. Anyway, we'll put that aside. That's going to be a side project. But now I need to put on the new throttle body. We have a new Continental. Continental. A kiss on the cheek can be quite continental. I don't think they were talking about this one though. The V12 BMWs all have throttle bodies that tend to die. And by die, I mean they get really gunked up, they get gross, so you have to open them up and clean them. For the V8s, BMW originally had the same, basically the same design, but then they changed it. So this is the old design, as we discussed, this car, this is the throttle body that this car left the factory with. Um, but it has the plastic cover here and with the tabs. So you could pry this open and clean it out, which I'm gonna do. 
but this is the new design, which has a metal tab running across the length of it. Theoretically, you could cut that off. You know, do I want to do that? No. <laughs> because then how are you going to secure it again? Right. Shall we give this a clean then? Yes. Intake actually looks pretty good. This is coming off when we do the timing chain guides because um, I'm going to do the valley pine gasket as well, which I can see is seeping. So that needs to be done. Install the throttle body. It may help to locate the bolts. Just a couple of twists there, love. They need to get to know each other first. I wonder what the torque spec for this is. I didn't actually look that up. Hmm. I mean, it's a 10 millimeter M5, M6, so I imagine it's probably very, very small. I'll check it in a moment. Le quatrième. Sometimes in Skelly's Garage we speak in English, sometimes we speak in German, sometimes we speak in French. I am a man of many flavors. Install that plug. Here it click. There we go. We have positive contact. That's what that's called. This is what happens when you come unprepared. And I came unprepared. I forgot to write this up beforehand. I didn't need, I don't, like Skelly's Garage isn't scripted, obviously. Um, there's no way you can script this much stupidity in one go. Um, so that's how you know I'm all natural, authentic. But, like, it does help to have your tightening torques and everything like that, which I usually do. I just forgot. Bottle valve. Where's AZ? Interesting. So, there is no BMW tightening torque for this, which I guess makes sense. You know, they're not going to put a tightening torque for literally every bolt on the car. They're not Porsche. So we're just going to use our best judgment. And my best judgment is just a little bit tighter than finger tight. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a low grade bolt. I don't want to have a vacuum leak, but I don't want to break the bolt. So we'll just let it bottom out and then kind of call it good. I love seeing shiny new things in the car, especially when, when they make the car go better. That's good. Okay, so that's the throttle body done. Reconnect the vacuum hose that we took off here. All right, and that's this hose retached. Let's give it the old what for and see if that fixed the issue. Great, the throttle body has been completely unfaffed. Now, normally I would get started on doing the next thing, which is actually in this same box, but it's 10.42 on a Sunday, and uh, I just spent like an hour and a half trying to put together a cart. But that's what you get when you sharp at Harbor Freight for a $65 cart. But anyway, through the magic of video editing, I'll rejoin you again soon. I don't know what time it is. But it's time to do some work on FAF. The next thing we're going to take care of is a part of the cooling system. Right here in this box is a new fan clutch made by Marle Bear. The basic premise, as I understand it, and feel free to correct me, is pulley goes fast, fan does not. Pulley gets hot because engine is hot. The viscous fluid in the clutch starts to heat up and becomes more viscous, which makes the fan spin faster and faster until it matches the speed of the engine which then flows air over the radiator, thereby cooling it down. Now in this car, we actually have two fans. You will remember that I replaced one of them in episode four. What I discovered shortly after I replaced that fan is that this fan kicks on all the time. And the only reason why this fan would be kicking on all the time is if the clutch fan or fan clutch, I actually don't know which one it is, has failed and it's not providing adequate cooling. First, we gotta get our favorite tools, the fan clutch removal tools right here. We line up with the holes on this tool with the pulley bolts. Now that we have that attached, we take the big old wrench. Ow. Easiest way that you can see that it's failing here is because I know that this engine is hot. I just drove it here. I'm spinning it, but the, like, the clutch isn't really engaging. Here is the fan. 
part of the fan is this fan clutch. So our task is to remove these three bolts, clean this up, and put the new one on. And now we merely pull the fan off, and there we go. Here is our fan blades, and here is the old fan clutch. It's pretty warm. If it's warm, it should lock. And here is the new part, all shiny-like. I don't want to put a beautiful new shiny part onto a, a gross fan, so let me go clean that up real quick. I'm not doing this in the hood of my car because I like to live dangerously, though I do, but rather because there's not really any other option. I am going to get a workbench in here, but so far I have not found one that will both fit and meets the stringent requirements to be a part of Skelly's Garage. And those requirements are, it's cheap. These only get 10 Newton meters of torque, so it's really not very much at all. And on you go. This is my favorite part of working on any car, reinstalling the fan clutch. Okay, perfect. That's the fan clutch sorted. Hello again. Today's a new day. I want to get some more stuff done on FAF. But there's one problem. This beast is occupying the space, and while theoretically I can fit two cars in here, realistically that makes it very difficult to actually get anything done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit here on my stool, eat a burrito, and then try to figure out a solution. I think I know how to do it, and it's probably not going to be too painful. Hmm. That might actually work. I'll explain what I'm doing just as soon as I have my burrito. Cheers. So now that I've had my lunch, let's try to figure this out. The problem isn't so much getting the gray lady out of the garage. I can do that. That's not that big of an issue. I can just push it out. The problem is getting it back in. Now the driveway to the garage is at an incline and uh, try as I might, I don't think that I have it in me to push this, what is it, 4,800 pound SUV back into place once I'm done. And it certainly doesn't run, we know that. I could put it all back together, but I don't, I don't want to do that. So instead what we're going to try to do is I am going to use the magic power of the engine starter. Now the Grey Lady, as you know, does have a manual transmission. See, we can wiggle it right here. But it is a modern car, which also means that it has a clutch interlock. Unless you hold the clutch, you get no starter. And so what I'm going to try to do, and see if it's possible, is I'm going to disable this clutch interlock through software, and uh, once I'm done, I'll use the starter to get it back into the garage. That should be pretty straightforward. I don't know that you're going to be able to really see anything, but we'll give it a go. So the clutch interlock, or either I think it's actually called the clutch safety switch, is going to be located in most BMWs in the EWS module. So we read the module. Once the module has been read, we can open up the uh, program to process the data, which is called NCS Navi. WSC81. So the option that we want is right here. Park Neutral Eingang, which states that the engine will start only in park or neutral gear. So clicking Nicht Aktiv here, uh, should actually allow us to disable the clutch safety switch. So now we're going to write that back to the EWS module. If I did this right, when I turn the key, the engine should, should try to start. It won't, obviously, because it has no fuel and no spark, but... Excellent. I think we just solved our problem. not that bad. So out of all of the issues that we have with this car, none of them annoy me quite as much as the handbrake handle. When you pull the handbrake handle, sometimes it stays up. Sometimes it doesn't. So we're gonna fix that.
I know you can't see what I'm doing, but uh, I can't either, so. Cool. Okay. Wow. <sighs> Unfortunately, my camera's battery died while I was vacuuming, so you don't get to see that part. But you do get to see the results. I mean, it looks a thousand times better. There are still some stains. I want to buy a fabric cleaner. I thought I had one, but I, I, I guess I don't. And try to work some of those out. I can tell you for sure that uh, we're going to be back here again. <laughs> So um, let's do the thing that we came here to do. These two screws come out. This panel pops off. And now, that comes off. That's supposed to give me some access, and yet it doesn't really. Pull out the switch. There you go. And there that comes. So you're installed. Let's wrap the cables. It's hot and everything that I own that is electronic is just, the batteries are just getting very, very dead very quickly and it's really frustrating. And then that last annoying one. This one's gonna be really fun. This is a fun trick that sometimes works. Put the bolt into the socket and then stick the magnet through the socket. Sometimes it will work. But I think I found a method that kind of works. If you take the magnet and you kind of put it near the hole and then you use the screwdriver to step on it. Holy sh did that work? Very good. Wow, that was traumatizing. There's our socket. Okay, then we have this panel, which just pops into place and then is secured. Oh, I broke that. What a dingus. This is, as I've said countless times before, the screwdriver that BMW often includes in car toolkits. Why? Because it is a fantastic screwdriver and I really enjoy it. Ice cream truck has arrived. There we go! That feels great. That's exactly as it should be. Let's just test that the parking brake sensor comes on. Indeed it does! I should have probably tested that before I put, you know, everything back together, but I was pretty calm. It's a very simple sensor. You might be wondering, how gross was the seat underneath? I mean, given what we saw on the carpet and, you know, what is still there. I'll tell you, it wasn't altogether that pleasant. Um, I took care of it off camera, but uh, I can tell you that there was a lot of crap. <sighs> Let's put this seat back in because uh, I gotta drive this. <laughs> Now it's time to clean these trims and make sure that we put them back correctly. <sighs> I 
I know I said we were going to do more stuff. Well, I mean, I am, just not today. I am so, so, so tired of this. Um, it's really hot in here, and it's really humid. I am very happy, however, with what I've been able to achieve today. I definitely want to take the seat out to the other side, and I'll probably be removing this seat once more. Um, I need to get a carpet cleaner, because... I was hoping that I would be able to take care of the issues and the stains, but as it is obvious, I cannot. Anyway, I'm going to go home and cool off, and um, I'll be back. Alright, let's wrap this up. I have a few more things that I want to do. Forgive me, I'm wearing sweatpants. I know I'm a little bit underdressed. First order of business, this guy. This is the sensor that I broke. I broke the arm, and uh, anyway, it's pretty easy to replace. It only has, I think, two bolts that hold it in, so. Disconnect the connector. It's on there pretty good. There we go. Take this throw it into the trash, just like I did just now, <laughs> and uh, put the new one on. Positive contact, there we go, it's in place. And now, this other dingus, I take off the broken part, after the old one broke, this is all that was left, it really doesn't require very much torque at all. There we go. That's it. Now we should have working headlights. On to the next thing, which is also, like, right here. Okay, so... You can pretty plainly see what happened here, right? Yeah, that'll give you erroneous messages. Let's disconnect that, throw that in the trash, and connect our new one. And there we go. Look at that. That's value for your money. So I know we've been doing this whole unfaffening thing for a long time now. So I guess let's take score. The exhaust, excellent. I think that the boys at Lou's Custom Exhaust did a fantastic job. I've been driving it around, no signs of shaking, no signs of looseness. It's absolutely in great working order. The throttle body, also fantastic. I didn't show you, but I did reset the adaptations and now it, you know, it works correctly. Um, but I don't have any more engine fail-safe codes. The responsiveness is significantly better. Fantastic. Fan clutch, that's in order as well. That one's a little bit more tough to just directly see the results of. The handbrake lever, I honestly can't believe how much of a life improvement that is. I mean. Until I replaced the lever, I had figured out a way to make it stay up consistently, but it was a pain. Finally, the headlight leveling sensor and the washer level sensor, honestly, those are just cherries on the pie. Finally gonna have it working headlights, and I'm finally gonna get rid of that stupid check control that just goes, bing, washer fluid low. Now I guess I'll actually know if my washer fluid is low. I do wanna say that the car is more or less at a baseline at this point. There's still a lot of things that I want to do on FAF. We've got stuff in the interior, we've got some upgrades coming, but you know, we'll, we'll address those in future episodes. As far as what I wanted to achieve in the unfaffening, I think we're there. The car rides nice, it doesn't have check engine lights, doesn't have weird check controls. It just feels like a car now, which is just amazing. Anyway, as always, let's close out the episode with a big, big thanks to you, viewer. I really appreciate that you're here. Your support has been just honestly, something else. I've really enjoyed making these videos for you, chatting with you guys in the comments section, so let's keep it rolling. And a particular word of thanks, as always, to those who choose to support this channel on Patreon. These fine names over here are providing some support to this channel, which means a tremendous amount, and I owe them, as always, a great deal of gratitude. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more, why not like and subscribe? It always helps the channel grow and helps me know that you're liking the things that you're seeing. It pleases the algorithm when I say this, I think. And if you want to see more frequent updates, as I always say, it's a lot easier for me to just 
and post something on the Instagram than it is to make a video, edit, and uh, a continually expanding process of the things that I do with the videos. Anyway, it's a lot easier for me to do all of that. As always, my name is Sam. This is Skelly's Garage. Behind me is Faf, and we'll see you on the next one.